Bolverism, or The Foundation of 20th Century Thought, by C.S. Lewis. It is a disastrous discovery, as Emerson says somewhere, that we exist. I mean, it is disastrous when instead of merely attending to the rose, we are forced to think of ourselves looking at the rose with a certain type of mind and a certain type of eyes. It is disastrous because, if you are not very careful, the colour of the rose gets attributed to our optic nerves and its scent to our noses, and in the end, there is no rose left. The professional philosophers have been bothered about this universal blackout for over 200 years, and the world has not much listened to them. But the same disaster is now occurring on a level we can all understand. We have recently discovered we exist in two new senses. The Freudians have discovered that we exist as bundles of complexes. The Marxians have discovered that we exist as a member of some economic class. In the old days, it was supposed that if a thing seemed obviously true to a hundred men, then it was probably true in fact. Nowadays, the Freudian will tell you to go and analyse the hundred. You will find that they all think Elizabeth I a great queen because they all have a mother complex. Their thoughts are psychologically tainted at the source. And the Marxist will tell you to go and examine the economic interests of the hundred. You will find that they think freedom a good thing because they are all members of the bourgeoisie whose prosperity is increased by a policy of laissez-faire. Their thoughts are ideologically tainted at the source. Now this is obviously great fun, but it has not always been noticed that there is a bill to pay for it. There are two questions that people who say this kind of thing ought to be asked. The first is this, are all thoughts thus tainted at the source, or only some? The second is, does the taint invalidate the tainted thought, in the sense of making it untrue, or not? If they say that all thoughts are thus tainted, then of course we must remind them that Freudianism and Marxism are just as much systems of thought as Christian theology or philosophical idealism. The Freudian and Marxian are in the same boat with all the rest of us and cannot criticise us from outside. They have sawn off the branch they were sitting on. If, on the other hand, they say that the taint need not invalidate their thinking, then neither need it invalidate ours, in which case they have saved their own branch, but also saved ours along with it. The only line they can really take is to say that some thoughts are tainted and others are not, which has the advantage, if Freudians and Marxians regard it as an advantage, of being what every sane man has always believed. But if that is so, We must then ask, how do you find out which are tainted and which are not? It is no earthly use saying that those are tainted which agree with the secret wishes of the thinker. Some of the things I should like to believe must in fact be true. It is impossible to arrange a universe which contradicts everyone's wishes in every respect, at every moment. Suppose I think, after doing my accounts, that I have a large balance at the bank. And suppose you want to find out whether this belief of mine is wishful thinking. You can never come to any conclusion by examining my psychological condition. Your only chance of finding out is to sit down and work through the sum yourself. When you have checked my figures, then, and only then, will you know whether I have that balance or not. If you find my arithmetic correct, then no amount of vaporing about my psychological condition can be anything but a waste of time. If you find my arithmetic wrong, then it may be relevant to explain psychologically how I came to be so bad at my arithmetic, and the doctrine of the concealed wish will become relevant. But only after you have yourself done the sum, and discovered me to be wrong on purely arithmetical grounds. It is the same with all thinking and all systems of thought. If you try to find out which are tainted by speculating about the wishes of the thinkers, you are merely making a fool of yourself. You must find out on purely logical grounds which of them do, in fact, break down as arguments. 
Afterwards, if you like, go on and discover the psychological causes of the error. In other words, you must show that a man is wrong before you start explaining why he is wrong. The modern method is to assume without discussion that he is wrong and then distract his attention from this, the only real issue, by busily explaining how he became so silly. In the course of the last 15 years, I have found this vice so common that I have had to invent a name for it. I call it bolverism. Someday I am going to write the biography of its imaginary inventor, Ezekiel Bolver, whose destiny was determined at the age of five when he heard his mother say to his father, who had been maintaining that two sides of a triangle were together greater than the third, Oh, you say that? Because you are a man. At that moment, Ebolva assures us, there flashed across my opening mind the great truth that refutation is no necessary part of argument. Assume that your opponent is wrong, and then explain his error, and the world will be at your feet. Attempt to prove that he is wrong, or worse still, try to find out whether he is wrong or right, and the national dynamism of our age will thrust you to the wall. That is how Bolva became one of the makers of the 20th century. I find the fruits of his discovery almost everywhere. Thus I see my religion dismissed on the grounds that the comfortable parson had every reason for assuring the 19th century worker that poverty would be rewarded in another world. Well, no doubt he had. On the assumption that Christianity is an error, I can see easily enough that some people would still have a motive for inculcating it. I see it so easily that I can, of course, play the game the other way round, by saying that the modern man has every reason for trying to convince himself that there are no eternal sanctions behind the morality he is rejecting. For bolverism is a truly democratic game, in the sense that all can play it all day long, and that it gives no unfair privilege to the small and offensive minority who reason. But of course it gets us not one inch nearer to deciding whether, as a matter of fact, the Christian religion is true or false. That question remains to be discussed on quite different grounds, a matter of philosophical and historical argument. However it were decided, the improper motives of some people, both for believing it and for disbelieving it, would remain just as they are. I see bolverism at work in every political argument. The capitalists must be bad economists, because we know why they want capitalism. And equally, the communists must be bad economists, because we know why they want communism. Thus, the bolverists on both sides. In reality, of course, either the doctrines of the capitalists are false, or the doctrines of the communists, or both. But you can only find out the rights and wrongs by reasoning never by being rude about your opponent's psychology. Until bolverism is crushed, reason can play no effective part in human affairs. Each side snatches it early as a weapon against the other. But between the two, reason itself is discredited. And why should reason not be discredited? It would be easy in answer to point to the present state of the world but the real answer is even more immediate. The forces discrediting reason themselves depend on reasoning. You must reason even to bulverize. You are trying to prove that all proofs are invalid. If you fail, you fail. If you succeed, then you fail even more. For the proof that all proofs are invalid must be invalid itself. The alternative then is either sheer self-contradicting idiocy, or else some tenacious belief in our power of reasoning, held in the teeth of all the evidence that bolverists can bring for a taint in this or that human reasoner. I am ready to admit, if you like, that this tenacious belief has something transcendental or mystical about it. What then? Would you rather be a lunatic than a mystic? So we see there is a justification for holding on to our belief in reason. But can this be done without theism? Does I know involve that God exists?